The situation for ISIS has been deteriorating drastically in eastern Hama, resulting in ISIS being besieged in Akirabat. The evacuation of women and children was facilitated by some rebel groups. After recently losing territory to the rebels, the regime countered by opening a route for ISIS from besieged Akirabat to the liberated territories. Mysteriously, a large ISIS convoy traveled with heavy weapons and tanks, tens of kilometers through regime territory, capturing several villages from rebel control in northeastern Hama. Tonight, we want your input as we discuss the presence and possible threat posed by ISIS families now under rebel governance. So please do join us with your suggestions and comments at 9 p.m. Syrian time, that's 7 p.m. UK time, for Face the Truth. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillahi alhamdulillah. As salatu wa salam ala rasulullah wa ala alihi wa ashabi ajma'in. Welcome everybody from around the world who are joining us. I am Bilal Abdul Karim and this is Face the Truth. And as you saw from the intro, we're going to be talking today about uh, the families of ISIS fighters. What should be done with them? How should this very sensitive topic be dealt with? Now, before we start, we want to let you know, tonight is your night. We need to hear your comments. These are issues which are pertaining to the Ummah, and we really need to have your comments. Now, uh, here at OGN, all types of people watch our programs, from the people who are uh, uh, just sitting at home like you, to the CIA, to the FBI, all the way to leaders of some of the groups which are here. They watch OGN. So, therefore, we want to see if we can perhaps come to some type of uh, something which can be done with these families. Now, a lot of people are going to be sitting there saying, wait a minute, this should be very, very clear. You should allow these, pe th these women and these children into rebel-controlled territory and they should be treated well. Well, I am not saying that you should or you should not do that. That's what I'm here to facilitate from you. However, I think it's interesting that you should know some of the information which just happened today, just a few hours ago as a matter of fact. We've been publicizing something that took place a couple of days ago that just after uh, Hayat Tahrir Sham um, in northern Hema took the Abu Dali uh, strategic village. Interestingly enough, uh, from Akirabat, which is an area which was besieged, which was what? Besieged by uh, Syrian Arab army regime forces. And then somehow, ISIS fighters were allowed to take their weapons and tanks through regime territory, and we're talking about a good number of kilometers, to launch an attack on Hayat Tahrir Sham uh, fighters in rebel-controlled territory. That's very interesting. How did that happen? Obviously, it seems obvious that there had to be some type of collusion or allowance. But that's not the topic right now. The topic is the women and the children. Well, it appears that some women and children went along with them. And today, they, uh, a, a deal was made between Hayat Tahrir Sham and the, uh, 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 the uh, uh, ISIS fighters that the women only, the women only would be able to travel uh, over to a uh, rebel controlled territory in an act of uh, mercy. Now, what took place? As they were uh, attempting to cross over, it was discovered that they had Kalashnikovs and explosive belts. Now, this is authentic information that came to us just a few hours ago that we checked to try to verify it, so we're bringing you authentic information. They were told that all weaponry and explosives had to be left behind or the deal was off. And they implemented this deal and therefore they were able to cross over. So my question to you all is this. This mentality that ISIS fighters have, which is that 
uh, rebels are not Muslim. They've left Islam, therefore their blood is halal or permissible to shed. We've seen this. We have seen many car bomb attacks, assassinations, which have been taking place on an ongoing basis. So now that you have the information, we want you to send in your comments. We want to hear from you, and we're going to start discussing them right now. Let's go to uh, one of the comments in which we have uh, here. Let's just start with a sumo wrestler. And he said, I was with ISIS for over two years, and I guarantee you that most sister Muhajirat, most of them widowed, especially in Akirabat village, have wanted to leave ISIS terrorists for months. But they didn't find a route because of the spies and so-called amniyin. So they should be treated with mercy and Islamic manners. And that's a very in, um, important point in which this uh, sumo wrestler has uh, um, brought forward. We know because some of these women contact us. They contact me sometimes asking if I know a route out of um, ISIS controlled territory. That's the reality. There are women who want to leave, who don't want to be a part of what's been going on there. They got involved in something. It turned out not to be what they thought it was, but they've been trapped and haven't been able to get out. That's something that's very, very important that has to be taken into account. Now, I've got another thing from here that said, uh, from Anna Katnin that says, they are still women and children for God's sake. Okay, um, I understand the point that you're making here. Um, I get that. Um, but also it has to be borne in mind that when there are these suicide attacks, car bomb attacks, and assassinations, Keep in mind that there are also women and children on the rebel side which get caught up in their indiscriminate attacks. ISIS fighters are known not to discriminate. For example, when they tried to do an uh, assassination on the religious uh, sheikh, uh, Abdullah Muhaysini, that uh, uh, assassination attempt was done in front of the masjid after the khutbah of Juma, which would mean that it was full of people outside. OGN was fortunate enough to actually get a recording from the telephones, which were used to communicate between the people who actually carried out the attacks and their um, uh, umara or their emirs or their leaders. And they said very clearly, and you can look on the uh, OGN Facebook page or the website and you can listen to it, uh, they said very clearly, Mohaysini is here, send 20 suicide bombers. Well, they didn't send 20, but they did send one. And it wasn't just uh, 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 an, an attack on Mohaysini, it was an attack on everybody that was out there at that time. I think that also has to be born in money, uh, uh, in mind. Okay, Mustafa um, uh, Asafari said, Beware of Daeshi women. They will make takfir, meaning declare people to be outside of the fold of Islam, on you. Take your money and then make hijra to marry a Daeshi. Okay, all right, uh, uh, take your money. Okay, I didn't quite get that, but I'm sure that there was something good in there. Um, and maybe he can send the message back because I didn't quite understand that. Uh, it says here, try to help them, but if they are ex-fighters, then make them join the Mujahideen. Well, how practical would that really be? Because um, if you have people who were fighting and were attempting to kill rebel fighters on this side of the divide, and then all of a sudden you're giving them weapons and placing them in the midst of these rebel fighters, is that a responsible thing to do? That's something we have to, uh, we've got to consider. I don't think that we can just discount that. Okay, um, we have here uh, that uh, Callie Kozlowski said, 
What have the rebels said about the ISIS wives and children coming there? There's a lot of sympathy for these women, to be honest with you, and these children. There is a lot of sympathy. Um, there are few people who want to say, send them back over to the regime, let them be killed. There, there are very few people. There are some, but very few people who think that that's actually a good idea. Now, after having said that, there's also an issue that this has to be dealt with responsibly because rebels have a responsibility to protect the citizens in the territories in which they control. Uh, ISIS fighters are known to be those who do not discriminate in their attacks. So how practical is that? That's a question that we're going to be wrestling with here today. Okay, next we have here. Some of them are already in Idlib, and guess what? They are making takfir on the people who have helped them and gave them a place to live. Wow, thank you. Um, I think I'm going to have to take everybody back about uh, two and a half years ago when the fight uh, just began between ISIS and rebel forces. Now, when that began, there was, there was a lot of sympathy. Even though there was a lot of problems, there were a lot of problems between ISIS fighters and, like, everybody else, all the other groups, people had a softness for the women and the children. The group, Ahrar Shem, in spite of the fact that they were fiercely opposed to ISIS, they ferried, and I know from first-hand accounts, they ferried the women and children while the fighting was going on, the women and children of ISIS fighters into safer territory. No sooner did they arrive there, but they were doing just what um, uh, this uh, person, uh, Retter Turf, uh, said. They began to make takfir on the very people who rescued them. So um, this is, uh, um, this can't be discounted. And we're coming at you from northern Syria. And we have much experience with ISIS fighters and their women. Um, we would uh, say, uh, Ali um, Muhammad said, ISIS and Assad are really animals. Um, yeah, I agree. ISIS and, anim uh, and, and Esed are both animals because uh, they don't consider the sanctity of the blood of the Muslims. So, um, or I think for any other uh, people, even if they're Christians who are in these areas, like I know a Christian church was, was bombed here in Idlib. Um, so, and we covered that. So we know this from a firsthand account. Now we have another uh, comment that's here. This is from Bill Keys. She says, so you are asking about what to do with women and children. Have you lost your mind? Okay, excellent. But I'd like to ask you this, Bilkis. If these people are allowed to come over across the border, and as we mentioned in the early part of this program, that when they tried to cross over today, they tried to bring with them Kalashnikovs and explosive belts. So my question to you is, would a parent of a child that may be killed in one of their attempted uh, suicide attacks as they are known to carry out, would that mother or that father have a right to complain because they would say that the authorities, meaning rebel forces, acted irresponsibly by letting these people come into rebel-controlled territory. So I want you to understand the nuances here. I'm not saying whether they should or they shouldn't, but I want you to understand what this is actually all about. We are dealing with very dangerous people, and I think that needs to be taken into account. Uh, uh, Musa uh, Mahmaz, he says, bring them to court, but let the children be safe. That's an interesting approach. Bring them to court, but let the children be safe. Uh, I think we're also going to have to wonder that what happens if you have so many uh, 
uh, people who are, get caught up in the court system. So if, there's, if they're going to go to court, there's the possibility that they may be imprisoned. So what happens to the children? Will the children be split from their parents or from their mothers? Or will the children have to be imprisoned along with the mothers? As everybody may be starting to see that this is a very, very complicated and tangled situation. Um, let's talk about uh, what uh, Tawheed Allah said. He says, all the hard-earned territory the rebels gained is being handed on a golden plate to the regime. Um, I'm not sure what that has to do with the topic. So, uh, okay, we'll maybe come back to that another time. Um, it says here from uh, Rama Muhammad, he says, a database to be made and monitoring of these individuals. A database could be made, but... Let's ask this question. Where's the database going to come from? Okay, so let's say that you have in an area of 200, 300, 400, 500 families. And what is actually in the database? They will tell you that they are so and so and so and so. And then after that, they are released into society. My question to you, uh, Rama, is this. Is that the responsible thing to do? I'm not saying it is or it isn't, but I'd like to know what you think. Would that be responsible? Because basically what you're doing is you're saying, leave your name and your children's name and just go. And I'm not certain that that's the most responsible way to handle that. Um, let's continue here. Uh, Yasin, he says, Question them and find out about their aqidah or their belief. If it is sound and they aren't extreme, then let them stay in the community. If it isn't sound and they are extreme, then keep them out and put them in de-radicalization camps. Now, that's, now, now, now there's a thought right here. I'm not talking about the de-radicalization camps, but the issue that you might face in that regard is that when they sit in front of you, very few of them are going to say, yes, I believe that all of you are all non-Muslims, and I'm hoping you'll be dead by noon. Very few of them are going to come forward with this uh, uh, clarity um, and say that, which would mean is that examining their aqidah is go or their belief is going to be difficult. Um, perhaps an idea might be is that as soon as they come across the border, that the condition that they can stay in rebel-controlled territory is that they have to go through a de-radicalization program. Now, that might be an idea. It might be practical. But there are many families showing up. So, you know, that's something that has to be uh, uh, kept in mind. Um, Abu Habib Stevenson, he sent in a comment and he said, do they take an oath to denounce ISIS? Um, Abu Habib, how much stock could we really put in an oath from people which are known to carry out suicide attacks in areas where there are civilians? Uh, ta uh, targeting the very people that open their doors to them. These people are known for this. Um, so I'm just thinking that taking an oath to denounce ISIS, you're going to get a hundred out of a hundred people, you're going to get a hundred to denounce them because there's certain death, uh, or it appears to be that way, on the other side of that barrier. So therefore, to save themselves, of course, they're going to tell you anything that you want to hear. So I think we might have to dig a little bit deeper if we want to get the, um, uh, uh, you know, get to the bottom of it. Um, Sir Khan Shetan said, Daesh and the PYD serve the same source, which is the United States of America. Um, well, I don't know. That's possible. Uh, this is uh, Sir Khan's comment. Be interesting to see what other people out there think. Uh, I'm not so certain, but once again, uh, as we spoke about in the beginning of this program, how in the world did ISIS fighters with their weapons and tanks cross 
uh, uh, tens of kilometers from Aqirabat area into the Rahjan area of, uh, of uh, the northern Hema region without being detected by Assad forces. There was a siege around there. How in the world did that happen? I don't have a response for that. But it seems extremely strange and it seems like someone is colluding with the Syrian Arab army. But it will be up to them to clarify. Okay, um, we have another comment here. It says, it will be very easy for anyone with proper understanding of the deen to distinguish between a sincere believer, an ignorant, naive, enthusiastic individual, and someone who is playing with the religion. So yes, a screening process is vital, and those who were fooled by ISIS should be given extra care and compassion. Um, you know what? I'm going to beg to differ with you on this one. Uh, because you said it would be very easy for anyone with proper understanding of the religion to distinguish between a sincere believer and an ignorant, naive, enthusiastic individual. What if someone is an ignorant and enthusiastic individual, but he has very little Islamic knowledge, which is what you will find most of them to be, not some. Most of them to be, not some most of them to be of those who were enthusiastic and had very little Islamic knowledge. I know them personally and I have had many discussions with them. Basic belief uh, 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 points they did not know, but they were whipped up into a frenzy, uh, something about, um, you know, we have to stand up for Islam and, and they're raping the women, so therefore they went to the extreme. How could somebody, uh, first of all, those people who were ignorant, does that necessarily mean due to their ignorance they should be killed or they should be allowed to be killed or they should be left to be killed? I think that's something that we're going to have to talk about. Um, so I don't think that it's easy for someone with the correct understanding just to be able to distinguish. If he could look into people's hearts, yes, but we don't have that mechanism, do we? Okay, next up we have Enrica Petrucci, and she says, they are not dangerous people. In my personal opinion, they must be protected from the Assad regime everywhere Muslims are not to tolerate. Uh, uh, I think that a lot of people share that opinion that they should be protected, but how to do it so that the people on the other side of the divide are protected from them. That's the key. Uh, let's see what Amjad Farooqi said. He said, kill them all like they did before with the Mujahideen. They are Khawarij, they are the they are the partners of America and Israel. Um, you know, while not being a conspiracy theorist myself, are they the partners of Israel and America? Only Allah knows. Um, I'm not in a position to authenticate that or deny that. I really couldn't tell you. Um, but the idea that, that we should, um, you know, like to see all of them killed I think that's a little bit extreme, you know, and we don't want ISIS to be our teachers. We want to be people of mercy, compassion, kindness, and understanding. They were not people who shared those characteristics. So therefore, we don't want their ugliness to become the norm for us. And next, we have Jan uh, Yanilmez. Please forgive me if I mispronounce that. Jan Yanilmez. And it was said, maybe bring them to special houses to live where they are forced to marry a non khariji in the next years. Um, forced marriages are not allowed in Islam. They are not considered to be um, uh, marriages, a valid marriage, because a, um, one of the conditions of a marriage is that it has to be, have the consent of the woman. So forcing her um, would not be allowed or permissible. So I think we're going to let that one go. Um, 
uh, Stephanie Go said they should be educated. Agreed, they should be educated. Uh, Shafqul Islam said internment camps until the war is over. Now there's an interesting thought um, regarding uh, having them housed in a certain area specific to them and then there would be they would be educated or uh, go through what is uh, what could be called a de-radicalization program but then the issue is going to come about here is number one if you've got ten families you can do that what about a hundred what about a thousand what about five people per family and you've got five thousand families as you can see the group known as ISIS is losing much territory and many, many, many of their women and children are becoming displaced. So that's something that has to be kept in mind. But um, I don't mean a, a, an internment camp, but I do think that some type of educational facility which isolates them from the rest of society for a period of time might be something that would be interesting. Um, Bloody Dave, uh-oh, interesting name, I don't know what he's going to say. He says, interesting debate, as we in the West ponder what to do with returnees, so is Idlib. Uh, that's something that has, to be, uh, that has to be looked at, you know. Um, it's really something um, uh, Western governments um, are fearing uh, fighters returning from here. Um, I would say that unless they know that uh, these fighters have come from a group which is uh, prescribed for them uh, um, or is, is a group that is a, a terrorist organization or something like that, that they shouldn't speculate and that they shouldn't be looking for trouble. However, if we look at this ISIS situation, we know where these people are coming from and what they were a part of. So I think that we have to do a better job than Western governments, and we have to have more compassion, more understanding, and we have to be empathic to understand that a lot of these people who got caught up in this ISIS mess, a lot of these people didn't know what they were getting involved in. I knew people in 2014, 2015 that were very, very uh, 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 respectable people but they didn't have enough knowledge to safeguard themselves from the tricks of Baghdadi and Adnani and a lot of those other no good nicks. So basically, they uh, got caught up in this mess, and once they got there, they had no way to get out. That's something that we have to keep in mind, and we can't be ignorant to that. Um, next up, we have Ikram Okal, and he said, Send them to Sweden. Here, the government will give them houses and jobs. <laughs> okay, well, uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, who's going to buy the plane tickets? Okay, <laughs> next up, um, we're going to take two more. And we have Zahra Mecca, who said, All 900 male ISIS prisoners in Idlib should be conscripted as crack in Gamasi forces to attack regime until all of them are depleted. Okay, now, let me explain what, what uh, Zahra Mecca is saying. What's being said here is that they should be um, outfitted with uh, weapons and explosives and be pointed in the direction of the regime. Well, I don't think that's a very good idea because the reality of the situation is that when you put weapons and explosives in these people's hands and say the bad guy is that way and then they just happen to turn around, then you got yourself a little problem. You see? So um, I do believe that that's something that should probably, like, oh, I don't know, not be done. Um, okay, uh, what we are going to do, I think we are going to, um, okay, l let's take um, one more. Uh, okay, I think we've just about um, had enough questions. We're going to continue this debate online, Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube. I am Bilal Abdul Kareem for Face the Truth. Jazakum Allah Khaira. I really appreciate everybody participating. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.